Are ANCAPs fundamentally the same as sovereign citizens, or are these disparate ideologies totally at odds with one another? Or does the answer lie somewhere in the middle? Stay tuned to find out. Hello everyone, this is My Two Cents. Today's video comes via a patron request. A quick reminder to everyone that if you donate at least $10 a month or more to my channel, you're guaranteed to have your video requests made once you've been a patron for at least two months. The subject I've been asked to address is the sovereign citizen movement and whether or not sovereign citizens have anything in common with libertarians or anarcho-capitalists. For those of you who may not be familiar, let's first discuss what the sovereign citizen movement is. Do a quick Google search and it will immediately become evident that the federal government has quite the beef with sovereign citizens. Among the first results of your search, you'll find the Southern Poverty Law Center, the FBI, and a number of other sources, all of which classify sovereign citizens as a sort of domestic terror group. In fact, the FBI's 2010 post on the subject explains the sovereign citizen movement thus. Sovereign citizens are anti-government extremists who believe that even though they physically reside in this country, they are separate or sovereign from the United States. As a result, they believe they don't have to answer to any government authority, including courts, taxing entities, motor vehicle departments, or law enforcement. This causes all kinds of problems, and crimes. For example, many sovereign citizens don't pay their taxes. They hold illegal courts that issue warrants for judges and police officers. They clog up the court system with frivolous lawsuits and liens against public officials to harass them, and they use fake money orders, personal checks, and the like at government agencies, banks, and businesses. In addition, 60 Minutes has previously run a piece on the sovereign citizen movement, in which all of the experts they consulted painted sovereign citizens as being, for the most part, delusional jobless losers. Average sovereign citizen today is 30, 35, and is in economic dire straits. Um, they've probably lost their job. They've probably lost the wife. Paranoid? Uh, Many are. Conspiracy theorists? Most are. Now, before I make my comments on the subject, let me first say that like most groups or ideologies, it's clear that the sovereign citizen movement is not monolithic. Within its ranks there are various people, some quite intelligent and some not so much, some violent and some peaceful. I don't wish to paint with too broad of a brush and can only comment based upon my own research, which, as I indicated, was difficult, since it's clear that the government, along with its tech giant cronies, doesn't want anyone researching or learning about the sovereign citizen movement, aside from those sources that paint them as criminals and a threat to a stable society. One always has to wonder why people so convinced they are in the right feel the need to shelter others from doing research about anyone who disagrees. So, let's first talk about where there is in fact overlap between sovereign citizens and anarcho-capitalists. I'd say that based on the research I've done, sovereign citizens are generally sound in their understanding of why the state is inherently illegitimate. I've explained this myself in videos such as Taxation is Theft and the Social Contract is BS, as well as Is the Government the Lesser of Two Evils? But to sum up, the state is illegitimate because it initiates force against peaceful people, stealing their property to fund its own endeavors, and exempting itself from the laws that it creates for everyone else to follow. Sovereign citizens rightly point out that they never consented to the government's rule, and therefore the government funding itself through taxes and operating via violent coercion is no different than the mob funding itself through protection money and using violent threats to accomplish its ends. They dress up and then they say, ta-da, now I represent government. I know I just look like a person, but I don't just have the rights of a person because I represent the magical deity called government. And so I'm allowed to demand your money and boss you around and hurt you if you disobey me. I'm acting on behalf of government and it has commandments called laws. And these laws aren't just the threats of humans. They are decrees from something superhuman. 
And so all you good people out there should bow to this deity. And if you want the world fixed, this is what you pray to. And we give you certain rituals of, of how to pray to it and when you're supposed to pray to it and pray to the God to make the world what you wish it was and to save you from all the uncertainties of reality. The doctrine people are taught is just patently absurd. And a bunch of examples of that are like consent of the governed. There isn't such thing. If it's consent, it's voluntary. If it's being governed, it's not. The actual given excuse is we have the right to rule you because you decided we did even if you didn't vote for us and even if you oppose everything we do to you and well they represent us okay they represent us by doing a lot of things that we don't have the right to do and they represent us by bossing us around and taking our money like i bet if i went to my neighbor and bossed him around and took his money and said i'm representing you he would say what what a stupid thing to say to me the most insane is we are the government which you hear everywhere and I ask somebody, wait, do you really not notice that there's a group of people over there, they issue threats, and they call them laws, and they issue demands for money, and they call it taxes, and if you disobey, they send men with guns to hurt you. Now, are you really incapable of distinguishing between yourself and them? However, where sovereign citizens and ANCAPs part ways is in virtue of how they believe a non-statist should respond to the state's illegitimate use of force. As alluded to in the FBI's description, most sovereign citizens attempt to circumvent the government through various legal loopholes, many of them renouncing their citizenship and filling out documents that they seek to use in place of government-issued IDs. When they are pulled over at traffic stops or contacted by the IRS about unpaid taxes, Sovereign citizens will attempt to make a legal case in court that they have opted out of citizenship and therefore have no obligation to follow the rules that citizens do. They think that if they sign documents in red crayons, it takes them out of the jurisdiction of the court. Red crayons? Some do, yeah. They think that if they sign their name on an angle or put a thumbprint in blood, I mean, I can come up with several hundred of these examples, that sound ludicrous to someone outside, to the people within the movement, they make perfect sense. Again, I agree with sovereign citizens that the state is illegitimate. However, if you really think that the state is going to let you get away with being free through finding legal loopholes, or seeking to argue for your sovereignty on the basis of the Constitution, Articles of Confederation, or any other document from the days of the Founding Fathers, you're kidding yourself. The state, like all individuals, acts in its own self-interest. But since the state operates with the perceived legitimacy to use force, it will inevitably grow in size and scope, altering its own laws and policies whenever they hinder it from doing so. An excellent example of this can be found in the case of Galveston County, Texas. In 1981, Galveston County, Texas, recognizing that the federal government's Social Security Administration is nothing but a legalized Ponzi scheme, found a loophole in federal law and withdrew itself from the system. Good for them, of course. We've known that Social Security is a Ponzi scheme for a long time, and in the coming years, as more and more baby boomers retire, America is about to see the collapse of the system that the government has long promised will provide for them in exchange for their years of paying taxes into the system. However, do you think the federal government allowed other parts of the country to do the same? Of course not. By 1983, Congress had effectively closed the loophole that Galveston County found, ensuring that no other parts of the country could do the same. This is only one example, of course, but my point is that even if a sovereign citizen were to construct a rock-solid legal way to circumvent federal law and obtain true sovereignty from the government, it wouldn't be long before the laws were changed so that no one else could ever successfully do the same. Anyone who understands how the state operates ought to know that if there is in fact a legal way to stop the state from getting what it wants, it will not be legal for long. The mayor just broke his own law. Mmm, that's a good point. I guess I'll just have to resign in scandal while leaving the law intact. Or, you could just change the law. Alright then. Well, what about those sovereign citizens that do violently act against the government? I've made clear in the past that I explicitly condemn any and all advocacy of the use of force and armed revolution to achieve any end, even if the end itself is a noble one. 
For one, it doesn't make sense that people arguing that the use of force is inherently unjust would then rely on the use of force to achieve their desired ends. And further, the ends do not justify the means. Trying to bring about an anarcho-capitalist society through the use of a violent revolution is an oxymoron, since the body of individuals that lead the revolution would themselves become a state if they succeed. Esoteric the Free has previously made a video on this subject, so I'll quickly allow him to explain this. It relies on the assumption that when you actually do overthrow the state, the group which has seized control of the government, which now has full centralization, won't just keep the power to themselves, which the latter of the two steps is why revolutions usually result in spawning brutal dictatorships. Yes, despite common misconception, a revolution against the government is actually statist because all you're doing is using force to overthrow a previous state and installing a new one and hoping that the new one with full centralization is just going to work in your favor. So yeah, in short, revolutions are idiotic and you're dreaming if you think you're going to create a voluntarist society out of the violent overthrow of a previous state. Now, to be sure, the one legitimate use of force is in self-defense against an aggressor, and historically there are examples of revolutions that were justified as acts of self-defense against tyranny. Heck, every good American learns in school that the American Revolution was just an act of self-defense against the tyrannical British Empire. However, the thing the schools don't seem to focus on is that violent revolutions also tend to result in even more tyrannical totalitarian governments. The French Revolution, the Iranian Revolution, Heck, even the American Revolution didn't lead to a smooth transition into liberty and limited government. Anyone who has studied the early history of the U.S. beyond the flowery version you are given in public school will see that Washington's presidency was notably totalitarian. Americans lucked out in virtue of the fact that Washington turned out to be a morally better person than, say, Robespierre or Hitler. But it doesn't change the fact that Washington did function as a totalitarian ruler, and the government of the U.S. has been becoming more and more totalitarian ever since. If you disagree, simply look into Washington's role in Shays' Rebellion, or the Sedition Act. For this reason, anarcho-capitalists advocate agorism and counter-economics as the method by which a stateless society will ultimately be achieved. I'm not going to take time explaining this here, since that's not the topic of this video, but if you would like to learn more about it, Esoteric the Free has a number of good videos on the subject, which will be listed in this video's corresponding blog post on my website, my2sensevideos.com. It would seem to me that this is the largest distinction between ANCAPs and sovereign citizens. Sovereign citizens seem to believe that through their personal refusal to submit to the state, they can affect change. However, this is kind of like saying that an individual who was displeased with the service he received at Walmart can bring the company down by refusing to shop there. Even if he was right about his not receiving quality service, Walmart has approximately 140 million customers per day. A single person voicing his protest will simply be ignored and have no effect on their operations. And so it is with a single citizen voicing his refusal to submit to the government's rule. Such a person will quickly be jailed and forgotten, making no difference in the grand scheme of things. On the other hand, if one instead works to spread the message of liberty, using their free speech to educate others on the illegitimacy of the state, change might not happen overnight, but can be affected in the long run. As more and more people refuse to see the state as their lord and savior, they'll stop turning to it to fix their problems, reject their inherently worthless fiat money, and create private solutions to their problems that are far more efficient and effective than anything the state could provide. Eventually, if this continues, the state will become irrelevant, its useful functions being privatized, and its unnecessary functions ceasing. If you have any questions or want to further discuss anything in this video, feel free to message me on the PhoneMe smartphone app. Use the promo code 2 cents and search for my 2 cents. The app is available for iPhone and Android. Links in the video description. Thank you to my patron for requesting this video, and again, a reminder to everyone that donating $10 a month or more to my channel guarantees that your video requests will be made once you've supported the channel for two months or more. You can support the channel through Subscribestar, Bitbacker, Patreon, or any of the other available methods. Head to my website, my2centsvideos.com, where you'll find the links to these platforms in any of my blog posts. And that is my two cents. Take it for what it's worth. Thanks everyone for watching. 
If you liked this video, please hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell to receive notifications of new uploads. And if you're a fan of my channel, please consider supporting me on Subscribestar, Bitbacker, or Patreon. For as low as $1 a month, you'll receive access to patron-exclusive videos, earn the right to participate in patrons-only live streams, join my patrons group chat on Twitter and Discord, and numerous other rewards. Also, be sure to subscribe to my gaming channel for a chance to hang out and chat during gaming streams. Uploads are every Thursday and Saturday, so stay tuned for more videos.